Welcome to Put Simply, the podcast that puts what's happening around the world simply without compromising on the details. Erdem Koch is my name and I'm joined by my co-hosts Ozan Ibrahim and Rodney McCune. Gents, good to see you both again. Great to see you. Been an interesting week. It has. And let's start in the Middle East, shall we, where Israeli troops have entered Lebanon in what the Israeli military calls a limited, localised and targeted ground operation against Hezbollah. Now, when we're recording this, at the time of recording, rather, more than a thousand people have been killed. Up to a million may now be displaced. And of course, it follows the killing of the Hezbollah leader, Hassan Nasrallah, earlier, which Israel uh, said was a sort of a key target in this offensive. The Lebanese prime minister has said that this they are now facing something unprecedented and increasingly worrying in the region. Uh, Rodney, let's start here. It's obviously a, a grim time for the world. You've worked with Middle Eastern governments before. How do you sort of see what's happening at the moment, the Israeli uh, incursion into Lebanon? And I guess, where do things go? If you could sort of give us a bit of an overview of your thoughts. Well, I mean, it's it's clearly a, a northern pivot by Israel in order to wind down what's happening in Gaza. I mean, domestically, the action already uh, in the north against Hezbollah is more popular domestically than uh, Netanyahu was experiencing from the, I'm going to call it a performance in, in terms of what was going on within Gaza, but obviously there's issues around hostages um, and other issues and taking out um, Nasrallah was a uh, popular act in terms of Israeli uh, domestic opinion. So there's a, certainly a domestic component to it, but there's also a broader regional um, play that's been move forward or, or progress by uh, Israel. They've been goading Iran for some time. You know, there's the helicopter incident in May. There was the consulate in Syria incident in April. Uh, and then uh, there was the Hamas leader who was um, uh, who was uh, targeted by uh, Israel, effectively targeted by Israel in, in, in Tehran in July. And there's a there's a broader testing um, of Iran by Israel. Uh, this is more than uh, simply securing the northern border. This is something much uh, more regional, uh, in my view. And, uh, you know, when uh, Netanyahu spoke on Monday, he addressed the Iranian people, how many of them, um, given uh, the media access, will actually hear that uh, in Iran. I'm not sure. But it was set up as a very clear um, warning, um, but also a positioning where the Iranian people uh, aren't the enemy of Israel, it's the regime, and it's the regime that's supporting Hezbollah, it's the regime that's supporting the Houthis in Yemen, and um, it's the regime which uh, supports um, Hamas in, 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 in Gaza and so on. So, you know, you'll not hear huge noise from the Gulf Arabs beyond the regular noise uh, in terms of uh, Palestine and Palestinian issues, because, of course, it's not unattractive for the Gulf Arabs to see uh, Iran, Iran uh, paired back within that region. Of course, anything that's limited, targeted and localised will often not be that. And it's going to have civilian casualties, as all conflict does. And um, those are the real um, difficult and thorny issues which will potentially cause um, things to uh, overplay in terms of Israel or responses to be more significant in terms of uh, what Iran may or may not do. But, you know, there's also the question of what can Iran do? What is the capacity of Hezbollah? Um, how far are Israel prepared to go under Netanyahu, probably further than many others? And, you know, what might seem like a smart play from Israel at the moment might prove to be um, a very poor decision in days, weeks and months from now. So it's um, a very tense period. There's already been a lot of um, unnecessary loss of life in Gaza. Israel are moving north, as I said, a northern pivot. And the next uh, hours and days for those in um, southern Lebanon, many of whom have been displaced already, I think it's in one million are said to have been displaced and moved north. 
um, similar on the other side of the border where people have been moving south to vacate the same region. Um, I know that they say that they're looking at uh, pushing Hezbollah back about 30 kilometres to what was in effect the 2006 UN resolution line. But again, um, targeted, localised, limited. Those are quite confident, but often pretty simple um, labels to add to something which is obviously um, full on ground military incursion and uh, conflict. Ozan, when this, I guess, latest round started on October 7 with the Hamas attack uh, in Israel and then the, the Israel assault on Gaza, I remember speaking to you when you were saying, if this spreads to Hezbollah, things start to get very, very serious from a regional and potentially sort of world conflict perspective. How worried are you that this is not going to be limited, localised and targeted and that it will continue to spread? You know, the, the terminology that Israel used um, is, I think, to the word identical to terminology that they used when they did the ground incursion into to, uh, Gaza a number of months back. So I'm um, not sure that uh, it will be what they claim to be. I think you know, Hezbollah is not Hamas. Hezbollah is a much better trained, uh, better equipped uh, opponent. And I think these uh, this is going to be a very, very difficult thing for Israel to undertake without causing, if you ask me, uh, mass destruction um, and uh, unfortunately uh, causing or resulting in many civilian deaths, um, many more civilian deaths, which, you know, at a time when we should be talking about ceasefire, we should be talking about de-escalating. Uh, what's happened this morning has really escalated and everybody who is uh, is a, a, an Iran watcher or a Middle East watcher, I think today uh, is really, really worried. Now, the reality is Israel's calculus, I think, is that Iran is no longer in a position to be able to to strike back uh, without causing serious serious uh, ramifications and um, uh, or repercussions for for itself, and I think they are relying on something and are confident that Iran's actions or Iran's response to this is not going to be catastrophic for them. You know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to bet on that because I think Iran has spent the last 15, 20 years building up a buffer against Israel's uh, what they perceive to be aggression against uh, itself uh, through Hezbollah. And that buffer uh, looks like it might get severely damaged over the next uh, little while as, as the, the ground incursion continues. And that can't be uh, all that good for, for Iran and, uh, and the regime. Because as Rodney touched on, uh, Iran's problems, if you ask me, are uh, as, as, as external as, as they are internal. They have serious domestic pressures. We saw over the last couple of years uh, significant protests, significant civil unrest, a lot of social movements being activated, uh, being energised against the regime. These are serious concerns for, for the regime. And if particularly to try and strengthen up their uh, domestic support amongst their supporters, they need to do something. However, I think they're very limited in terms of what they can do. We saw in April when they responded against Israel's attack on its diplomatic mission in Singapore, in Syria, that that attack was quite half-hearted and, you know, was very easily knocked back by uh, all of the allies, the UK, the US and, uh, and Israel. You know, just geographically speaking, Iran's ability to reach Israel is quite limited uh, given their proximity and, and given their distance. So I, I'm, they rely on their proxies, and one of their proxies is under serious, serious threat. And I think their hands are tied. There's not not a lot they can do without pulling in other countries into this. And I'm not sure they're going to come out on top if they start to pull in the US and, and other allies into a, a wider uh, regional conflict. Well, in yeah. so many ways, they already are. I mean, the, the US is sending an extra aircraft carrier with more troops to the region, which is basically designed as a deterrent against Iran. So it's almost a question of what the Iranian response is. Do they wait? Do they go? But Rodney, you were about to say something. I spoke over you there, mate. No, no. I'm, I, I mean, I, Ozan's bang on with the missile uh, barrage and drone barrage in, in, in April. And to be honest, it had a, a feeling of choreography about it. 
um, that it would play out in a certain way that, you know, everyone could be seen to be doing something without it being so catastrophic that um, that it would trigger something um, further and bigger. Uh, it was an off-ramp in a sense for, 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 for everyone concerned. But Israel now having um, uh, taken the action that they've taken through these you know, pagers and then the walkie talkies to really degrade the capacity of Hezbollah and then, you know, targeting leadership and so on. There's a potential that um, one Israel has miscalculated uh, and that there is some significant response. Um, but there's also the possibility that they have degraded um, Hezbollah to an extent where uh, they can uh, pursue uh, military outcomes in a way maybe they wouldn't have been able to do uh, previously or haven't done um, certainly for a significant period of time but then the question is what's going to limit the furtherance of that uh, you know where are the off ramps here there could be a temptation to for, you know for for for, for both uh, key players in this Iran and Israel to go much further uh, than either had anticipated they would um, when they made their initial calculations and that's why there's a high degree of risk attached to all aspects of this and notwithstanding the um, obvious um, civilian casualties that are likely to uh, come from this, there's there, there's another game being played out here, and it's one that has a high degree of risk attached to it. Well, I think the problem is no, no one can really say where this is saying, uh, where this is heading, right? And that yeah. is such a dangerous sort of thing. I mean, is it you know does Israel get bogged down in Lebanon as it did? between, you know, 1982 to the early 2000s, is it, is it really a miscalculation? Does Iran fire back? It's, it feels like we're on the edge of something monumental in the world in a bad way and not knowing where it's heading. I mean, beyond the, the, the incredible humanitarian disaster that we've already seen in Gaza for the past year and a bit, and, and you know, at least with the, with the assault on Gaza, obviously what has been happening on the ground there for, for several decades now has, has been worrying many people. You know, this last year, plus this sort of next chapter, I, I guess there's, there's absolute room for uh, anxiety and, and uh, even fear about what this means for the region and, and the rest of the world. What do you guys think from a economic perspective? Does this sort of, does it have implications beyond uh, the region? Like, does it, does it mean anything for a global economy that is, that feels like it's sort of starting to recover from the fragility that we've seen in the post pandemic period? Certainly any regional conflict in that region is going to have a major impact on, you know, on oil and, and, and various other, uh, well, the Yemen uh, conflict has already had a significant impact on, on shipping routes and, and what have you. But I, I think, look, the timing of this also is not, a coincidence, if you ask me, I think, you know, lead, putting the economic side or the economic impact to one side, that's, I think it's going to have a huge political impact, which is going to lead on to or, or translate to, into economic impact. I mean, we've look as Rodney mentioned, we've seen the theatre between Israel and Iran for the last six, seven months. But I think, you know, we talk about off ramps, there is no real off ramp without some serious face losing or losing face on 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 both sides here um we're talking about a, a netanyahu who knows fully where the us is today and that is we have a a, a lame duck president uh, we have an election in four or five weeks uh on one side um you know is a bloke that probably couldn't show you where any of these countries are on a map on the other side is an untested candidate um you know this is severely opportunistic from Netanyahu's end. Um, and, you know, I think the political impact is going to to severely translate into to an economic impact. I think, you know, just as the world economy was starting to show signs of, of you know, bouncing back from, from last year, inflation is getting under control in many places. The last thing that the world economy needs is a, another supply side shock like we had in, in uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, the mother of all supply shocks could occur if suddenly there is a, a major, major conflict in, in that region. Supply chain disruption, energy costs, uh, pressures on the cost of living, which is already a factor right across the West. Um, and indeed, it was it was, it was, it was, was a pressure point in uh, Japan uh, as well, when obviously there's been a 
uh, uh, a uh, political developments and change there. Um, so yes, there's always going to be that risk of um, further pressure being applied. But I, I do sense that, I, I know that America has, uh, the US has already come out and made its comments about this whole thing, but I do have a sense that the West aren't so concerned about someone applying political or military pressure on Iran, um, given their relationship with uh, Russia and the other conflict going on uh, in the Ukraine at the moment. And there's a, a possibility, I'm, I'm going to say a fair possibility, that there's quite a few countries that are comfortable with Israel being the party that's applying that pressure to Iran at the minute. So yes, whilst you're here for calls for ceasefires and other things, that uh, uncertainty in Iran and possibly uh, for the regime there, uh, looking to domestically shore up um, what could be a, its position in a, in a regional conflict, uh, will certainly uh, take its attention off how it uh, cooperates with uh, Russia in terms of what's going on in, in the Ukraine. So. There's 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 another dimension to this as well, um, outside the regional dimension, which um, is where the West really sits in relation to a lot of this. And I think one of the things that, uh, you know, a few episodes back, we had um, Ali Vayas on, who is an expert on Iran. I was really quite interested in what he had to say around other countries such as Russia, China, and his view was clearly that they would sit it out. Now, that was a different world back then, um, and we're only talking four or five months ago, I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, I'd love to get Ali back on and, uh, and, and get him to make the comments, but I think many of those countries, what, what is considered as Iran's allies uh, in the past, China and Russia, etc., I'm pretty sure they're watching with, with great anxiety as well. And I'm worried that there might be some opportunistic moves by them uh, to further pull in your, the US and, and its allies uh, and, and it become a, a bigger conflict than just the region. So unfortunately, not a lot of great news this week. Not from a from a regional or a humanitarian perspective, that is for sure. And I think uh, it's it's devastating to see some of the images come out and what is happening. And, and, you know, we forget that in the grand scheme of things, it's the people on the ground that, that suffer the most. And it's, uh, I think, all our hearts break when we when we see that. And so much of this is going to come down to uh, domestic pressures as well as international pressures. And speaking of domestic pressures, well, a very interesting result earlier this week in Austria, heading over to Europe now. The far-right Freedom Party in that country has opened a new door in the country's politics. In what was an unprecedented victory in the election, they won close to 30% of the vote. They will not be able to govern without a coalition, but it's certainly a new chapter in Austria's history, Rodney, was it a surprise that the Freedom Party got the vote that it did, especially in the context of the first round of the EU elections where we saw, I guess, the rise of the far right in Europe? So the um, polling in Austria uh, over the past uh, two years has really basically laid out that this was likely to be uh, where things were going to uh, end up. So if you've been following the polls, this certainly isn't a surprise outcome uh, this is a party which is um, very much on the on 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 the far right. They've been involved in uh, coalitions previously, but it's the first time that they've come out on top in an election with you know I pull in this. Um, I'm going to say the moderate right OVP who um, came in with about twenty six percent, with the Freedom Party coming in on twenty nine percent. Now the interesting angle in this, which is beyond. Uh, just the Freedom Party itself is the toxic label or perception uh, from the establishment parties uh, of their uh, current leader. Now, he's someone who's previously been in government. He was in a, he was the Interior Minister, um, for two years, um, seventeen I think to nineteen, um, which was before the Ibiza scandal, which brought down nineteen in twenty nineteen brought down the government. Uh, which was a uh, covert recording of a meeting in 2017 where there was an exchange or a purported to be an exchange of uh, an offer for government contracts for favourable news coverage. Um, and he, though it didn't involve him, 
uh, he was then responsible for uh, part of the investigation into this and it wasn't considered particularly um took it particularly seriously and uh, he then left office uh, at that time uh, and was um, and was considered to be uh, particularly toxic now his association with the far right in terms of identitarianism uh his stuff and rhetoric around uh immigrants is extremely strong uh he when he was a uh, minister focused on deportations uh, he had used the police against the media. He had been criticised for uh, restrictions on freedom of the press. He wanted to rename asylum centres as departure centres. Um, he had talked about, uh, during this campaign, concentrating uh, asylum camps, which was, again, a particular choice of language around previous uh, Austria-Germany far-right uh, regime. And he had, he had uh, on many occasions, called himself the People's Chancellor, um, which, of course, was a term associated with um, Hitler. So he um, plays very strongly uh, to uh, far-right rhetoric. Uh, he, he draws his hand back in the, the um, Second World War period of Austrian history, uh, at a funeral last week of one of a uh, former senior member of the Freedom Party, the SS anthem was played and it had an attendee list of uh, a number of current um, and former significant uh, players within that uh, party. So this is um, a very significantly far-right politician in Western Europe, distinct from Hungary, which of course fell within the Soviet uh, sphere of influence in terms of uh, his his also pro Russia pro Russia position, so you know distinct from Orban, um obviously uh, congratulated by Orban and and Wilders in 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 Denmark, but we're not yet at a position where we know what way it's going to play out in coalition. Uh, during the election campaign, other parties had said no coalition with the Freedom Party, um if he's anywhere near a government ministry. So his dreams of being the people's chancellor might uh, go with that. Uh, there's a discussion around a grand coalition to exclude uh, the Freedom Party on this occasion. But again, uh, there'll be concerns about the longer you push them outside, uh, is the net uh, result of that simply going to be an increased vote for them at a future poll uh, rather than having them in government and not doing particularly well and possibly that depressing their vote again but it's the it's the uh freedom party's leader uh herbert kickle who uh who is the toxic individual who the other parties don't want anywhere near a government ministry so if he if he holds out and his party holds out uh for him having to be in government um and the senior partner in a coalition uh well then it's going to be a very interesting a discussion over the next period of time. If the Freedom Party say, fine, he'll remain as the party leader, he'll not uh, seek government ministry, then I suspect there's a potential uh, from the Freedom Party being back in coalition with this centre-right party. But um, this is all going to be played out in, in discussions over the next period of time. And it'll be calculations on behalf of the Freedom Party if they want into government now or they feel that they're better out uh, for a longer period of time when they can position themselves again as anti-establishment and so on. So uh, interesting period for uh, Austria over the next few weeks. We know often these uh, coalitions can take some time uh, to uh, form, but I guess my sense will be that they will be in government rather than a grand coalition and that the argument about uh, keeping them out for longer will, will not win through. And I suspect the centre-right will do some sort of deal with them um, and find some grey area where they can maybe not have him as chancellor, but maybe he does return to government as a, in, a, in a ministerial position. But again, we'll see how that plays out over the coming days. Yeah, the whole conversation around pushing them out is a, is a really interesting one. I mean, the thing is, it's so consistent across what's happening in Europe, right? I mean, we see far-right parties uh, already in, in government or 
or you know at least pushing at the gates uh, in terms of getting a lot of policies across the across the line, especially around immigration. I mean, parties that are either classified as far right or or national or you know conservative are already in ruling coalitions in in Croatia, Czech Republic, in in Hungary, in Italy, in the Netherlands. You know, in Sweden, we're seeing a far right party is propping up a minority government. In Germany, we're seeing sort of uh, re- local elections uh, being sort of dominated by the right. Is that what? Is it about where things are at in the world at the moment? Do you think that we're seeing this rise, uh, this this tilt, if you like, uh, to the beyond the centre right to to the far right in in the in terms of the popularity of these parties popping up? Well, there's populism, there's far right, and then there's a uh, Herbert Kickel. I mean, this this guy is in in really a, a league of his own. Uh, Austria has delivered once again for us. Um, this person is being branded as people's chancellor, as Rodney mentioned. Um, he is a truly, truly toxic character. I think not to be surprised. I'm not you know, what we're seeing in terms of the rise of populism, far right ideology, etc. This is all, I think, to be expected because I think Europe has done a particularly bad job of of dealing with migration inflows. Um, and I think, you know, it's the lack of leadership in 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 a lot of the the leading European countries, uh, and allowing these issues to be uh, become the top issues that people respond to when it comes to elections and, and the political discourse. I think that's a failure on on behalf of of European leadership. Now, I think probably one could say that Europe has been severely impacted by the migration particularly over the last 10, 15 years, uh, Syrian refugees uh, and and from other places that are war-torn, etc. Uh, but, you know, there's there's a way of dealing with these things and, 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 and a way of uh, kind of making it into a political football, which I think ha- they've allowed this issue to become such a, a polarising issue that it's this is not a surprise. Um, but as I said, we need to be very specific about this this is not this is not uh orbon or trump style populism and right-wing rhetoric and 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 kind of populist uh overtunes this guy is a a serious serious sympathizer of 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 nazism from from what i can gather um and you know he's talking about how it's he doesn't want to be a, a a diverse country uh and he's pushing for homogeneity rather than diversity. I mean, these are things that we shouldn't be hearing in 2024. And of course, he's bringing kind of the whole Islamization of of, of the country. Uh, and, you know, you don't have to look very far from Austria to, to see that, uh, you know, what's happening in France, certain parts of Germany, etc. Yes, there's some serious concern from Germans, French people, etc., around the lack of integration of new migrants. Um, many of these people fleeing horrific, horrific circumstances. Um, and this is understandable. Uh, but, you know, as I said, it's a lack of leadership. It's a poor response to what has been a massively poor response to what has been a massive crisis in in a humanitarian crisis over the ten, last 10, 15 years because of all of the problems that, that we've faced, again, in the Middle East. Um, everything seems to, to, to lead back to the Middle East. Well, as if the elections uh, weren't enough across the course of 2024, Austria being the recent, one other country has unexpectedly snuck in, and that is Japan. The Japanese will head to the polls on October 27 after a snap election was called by the new Prime Minister, Shigeru Ishiba, Rodney, they snuck in just in time to make 2024 even more interesting. The year of elections, uh, and this one's one we weren't expecting. And, you know, when you look at uh, the uh, uh, leadership uh, contenders uh, this time around, um, you have a guy who uh, who has, as he said, he would call an early election. But, you know, it's his fifth time um, going for uh, prime ministership. Um, he had his first go, I think, in 2008. He went again in 12, uh, 16, and maybe 20, and um, sat it out in 2021. 
uh, to uh, finally at the age of 67, he was the oldest of the three candidates, um, secure a position as a prime minister, which is obviously a, a great personal uh, achievement. But he's now found himself where within a very short period, he's calling an election um, where uh, the cost of living uh, and uh, the uh, standing of the uh, LDP uh, with scandals and uh, donations issues and so on have really um, caused him to drop in the polls. Now, he positioned himself outside. He's in the party, but outside uh, the current uh, leadership because he wasn't a minister in the government prior uh, to winning the leadership election. Um, but he had served uh, in maybe 07 or 08 as a defence minister and then the agriculture minister for two short um, periods. Um, perhaps uh, at 67, he's not one for the future, but maybe in Japan, of all places, uh, life expectancy such that maybe he is still uh, considered to be a youthful candidate. But yeah, I mean, he's now going into an election, which is going to be a very difficult election uh, for his party. He's popular within the party. He's um, He went for the leadership uh, campaign. His leadership campaign was, was um, uh, founded on revitalising the economy, uh, being competent for security within the region. Obviously, there's... Uh, there's the issues of North Korea missile testing and, and both uh, uh, they and China uh, have had other incursions and Russia and China, in fact, uh, naval or sea incursions into territorial waters and so on. So there's a regional security issue. Uh, there's revitalizing the economy and then there's um, cleaning up uh, his own party, which is the other uh, promise that he's made. But of course, we can see if you look at the UK, the high Keir Starmer found that very um, type of pitch about cleaning up politics and, and service and so on, uh, came unstuck within a short period of time uh, through political donations and other things. And, you know, um, Sheba might find that it's exactly the same uh, for him uh, and that cleaning up the party might not be as easy a, a, easy a, a, a win um, as they'd like it to have been, especially when they're moving straight into an election campaign or any other baggage that happens to uh, come out in terms of scandal or corruption and so on, doesn't get attached to his predecessor, it gets attached to him. So this is going to be a difficult election. Uh, again, cost of living uh, becoming an issue. Um, you know, you look at, and we did touch on Austria, but you know, you look at these issues around immigration, not an issue in Japan, of course, uh, but you look at uh, pre pressures on because the economy can't support the level of public service that maybe people have previously experienced. Um, and it does cause uh, electors to look at alternatives, uh, even if there were alternatives that they wouldn't have previously looked at. So uh, it's a really interesting time in Japan. Uh, this has been you know, quite a turnover of leaders um, in recent years. And um, I'm not sure that this chap will last that long either. Ozan, can you win? Well, I mean, uh, uh, the guy's certainly got some perseverance. So, I mean, of course, I think they're likely to to to, to win. I can't see uh, the status quo changing. Uh, it's really around how much, how many seats they lose. Their their brand is severely damaged with all of the the scandals that have been uh, that have been a kind of uh, in the background. Uh, and you know, I think. They've got a number of economic problems that that are going to, as Rodney talked about, uh, cost of living. But you know, you've had a weak yen for a long time, or a weakening yen. Uh, you've had a massive migration of, um, you know, uh, manufacturing going out of Japan, uh, and m many of the companies uh, who had manufacturing in Japan, particularly Japanese companies, et cetera, are looking at, have been looking for a, a long time at, at getting out of Japan. Uh, you have had low interest rates for a very long time. You had deflation for a very long time. Um, you know, for the world's fourth uh, biggest economy um, is not in, in great health. And these are all the things that I think are going to be big issues and significant issues on the minds of Japanese uh, electors.
Uh, so I, I suspect they will punish the uh, the Liberal Democratic Party. Uh, it's just I'm not sure they're going to be able to punish them enough for them to uh, to lose. I mean, currently they've got 258 seats. Um, you know, the the closest next closest uh, party is the Constitutional Democratic Party, and they've got 99 seats. Uh, so you're looking at uh, quite a significant number of seats they need to make up. Um, I was quite uh, pleased to see that uh, there's quite a, a lot of uh, diversity in the the, the Japanese parliament. Uh, you've got a communist party that has 10 seats. That's uh, quite an interesting thing. <laughs> uh, free, free education for all uh, has, you know, they've currently got four seats. Um, so, yeah, look, I think traditionally, the Japanese parliament has uh, been quite pluralistic and you know, you've had many, many different parties being represented, but I can't see the liberal, the, the strong hold that they've got on power um, for the Liberal Democratic Party. I can't see that changing. Um, and he's a well-known politician. Um, he's, uh, as Rodney said, had five shots at it uh, and it's finally his time. I think he'll give it a pretty good go. And his father was a government minister as well, which isn't uncommon uh, oh. in these uh, Japanese political uh, dynasties. Of course. Speaking of dynasties, let's head over to the Pacific and to the US now. The election that everyone has its eyes on in 2024, as we record, two gentlemen are preparing for a debate. That's J.D. Vance and Tim Walls, of course, the presidential, the vice presidential nominees, I should say, for each party. Uh, Rodney, are you going to punish yourself and watch the VP debate? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I could not. I'm afraid. So uh, I'm pretty excited to watch this one. Excited? Um, well, just, it'll be interesting. Need more excitement in your life, mate. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Well, look, oh. you know, last week we were talking about this, and and you know, uh, Trump was up in the Sun Belt states, and uh, Harris was up in the Rust Belt, and you know, the polls have narrowed. Uh, in some of those key swing states, again, further, uh, some have uh, flipped very marginally, but all within the margin of error and so on. So these uh, these events can have an impact uh, on uh, voter intentions and so on. Uh, and given that there's not going, given it's too late to have another debate, as Trump said, uh, and we are now having another debate, but with the vice presidential candidates, I'm afraid it's the last debate we're going to get of this election, so um, might as well uh, take in the experience and hopefully uh, we'll see some fireworks. Uh, can, can anybody tell me whether they remember any part of the debate between uh, Kamala Harris and Pence? Because I, I honestly can't. I can't believe how much hype there is around Tim Boltz and, and uh, J.D. Vance. But this is the thing. I mean, vice president debates are usually not important at all. Like no one no, usually it's cares. Non, non -event. It's a non-event because no one really cares about the vice president, right? Like no, the, the, the contest in the U S because of the nature of the politics there is between the, the two front runners, you know, the two presidential candidates. It's, it's so interesting that this time round, it is such a, it is such a big deal. I mean, yeah, I really wonder why that is. Well, I mean, you've got so much hype around it um, because the l l let's be honest, we we haven't we we don't know much about those two, which is not again, you're not supposed to know a lot about the VP candidates, but you know, you look at the top of the ticket, you've got a a, a person who's been um, in 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 the headlines for the last ten years. I mean, everyone knows about Trump, Kamala Harris. People are still trying to kind of figure out, etc. But it's almost like You've got three new players uh, at this level, and Tim Waltz. I mean, he's he's nobody knows who Tim Waltz, or nobody really knew who Tim Waltz was before he was rehearsing to become the the VP uh, pick. So, I think there's a lot of curiosity, uh, and also, as much as we all think it's ridiculous, uh, some of the, the the push by JD Vance on 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 you know people eating pets, etc. What he has managed to do is is really create a name for himself now. I'm not sure how positive that name is, but he's certainly he's stolen a lot of oxygen uh, from from his uh, presidential nominee. But he's really, really figured out how to kind of get into the headlines. I mean, I, I think it was last weekend he did every single Sunday show in terms of the interview, did meet the press, and 
and uh, MSNBC, uh, Meet the Press, and I think CNN morning shows. So he, he is probably one of the the best known and least liked, I think, VP candidates that we've had for a long time. He's definitely not media shy. I'll give him that, and he, and he uh, does uh, he does uh, offer comment when a microphone's uh, placed in front of him. So, um, yeah, I guess with the amount of oxygen that Trump absorbs, you have to work incredibly hard to have any sort of profile as his running mate. But you He's know, done pretty well. <laughs> yeah, he has done well. But you you know, and we'll see how this debate goes. But we talked like last week. We were talking about Mark Robinson and and uh, his issues and so on. It's all forgotten. Even eating pets seems to be. Uh, a little bit in the past, you know, where Trump's moved on to uh, in terms of suggesting that uh, Kamala Harris is mentally impaired and so on. I mean, it's insane that this is where the election debate for the next president or the uh, election campaign or hype or discussion for the next president uh, of the US sits. And um, perhaps the VP debate, and I say this, without expectation and possibly more out of hope, um, might find itself a little bit more grounded in policy and reality. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that uh, how can you discuss policy with, with Trump um, or debate policy with Trump? At least on whatever you want about J.D. Vance, uh, he, does have, have, he does have a kind of intellectual grasp of, of the policies and and a vision and and whether you agree with it or not, you know, he, he has some sort of doctrine that he's following, um, you know, as much as he denies it, but a lot of the, the, the project 2025 is, is, uh, you know, he, he, he could have written that. Uh, so, and Tim Waltz, I'm not sure. Um, again, I think there's just a lot of curiosity around Tim Waltz um, and a lot of people are wanting to get to know him a bit better, but I, I think, you know, he's he's not a, an empty vessel when it comes to policy. I think he's he's done a, a pretty reasonable job implementing a lot of reforms as governor. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting. Let's say interesting indeed. And I just cannot believe the the different topics that we just in two weeks of doing this new format on this podcast have been discussing. But such are the modern times that we live in. Who else would have thought we'd have two assassination attempts in one presidential? Uh, campaign. But we'll continue to put things simply as much as possible on this podcast. Ozan and Rodney, good to see you again this week. See you next. Thank nice. you. And that's been this week's episode of Put Simply. Be sure to follow us on LinkedIn at Oroka Group to stay up to date with all the latest episodes and news. Feel free to leave a comment and suggestions on what you'd like to see featured on the podcast as well. Until next time, I'm Erdem Koch. And I'm Ozan Ibrahim. Thanks for listening.